Thank you. That's Joshua Brown of Joshua Brown of Sky Highland Outfitters. So let's please give him another round of applause. And as the name suggests, he is an outfitter, so talk to him after the program if you would like to be fitted with your own kilt. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, welcome to the, the event that at least some of us have been waiting for. Um, <laughs> Um, and we're almost there. You've been very patient tonight. My name is Rivka Sass, and I'm the director of the Sacramento Public Library, the best job in Sacramento. Thank you for joining us at our honorary branch, the Crest Theater. We did not think we could accommodate everyone in our li beautiful library gallery, and I think we were right. So we were right to do this. I have to say that our hearts are full of gratitude tonight for many reasons. And first of all, I have to thank all of you who live within the city limits of Sacramento and voted yes on Measure B. That, that allows us to keep our libraries in the, the 12 city libraries uh, within the city limits open. And we are thrilled about that. We're thrilled and gracious very grateful to the Friends of the Library who in part helped make tonight possible and who support so many of our programs at Sacramento Public Library. I have to thank the Crest Theater staff. Sid and her staff have been great. I think everything worked really smoothly and beautifully tonight, getting you all in and making, making that happen. And um, I said I have the best job in probably the world actually, I just said Sacramento, but it's actually the world and it's because the staff at Sacramento Public Library is so incredible. Um, I really did feel like the queen as I walked in tonight. Everything was organized, everything was done and people did a beautiful job. So I have to tell you, we have a delicious evening planned tonight. <laughs> our own Stephanie Borelli, a librarian at our central library, will be leading the conversation with Diana Gabaldone. And there's the first time I said it right. I've been waking up every night saying, I'm gonna mispronounce it, I'm gonna mispronounce it. It's bad to the bone, Gabaldone. <sighs> All right. <laughs> so um, anyway, we are, she's going to be leading the conversation. She's uh, going to do a wonderful job because she does that uh, at, at everything she does. And like all wonderful things that come from creative minds, I really feel the need to give credit where credit is due. Stephanie's the mastermind of this whole event. How many of you attended her How Outlandish series of events? Thank you. If you don't live in Sacramento, you missed out. That was only one of a notable books program that she did. She did a 12-part series celebrating the works of Jane Austen, which was very special. She's done uh, The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. She continues to amaze and delight us. And um, tonight we'll demonstrate that she is truly a Renaissance woman because not only does she hold degrees in both library and information science and literature, she is a very talented historic costumer, and those of you who've been here early saw her work all done by hand. All done, every bit of it by hand. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie Borelli. We'll see if she's too shy to come out. Now, before I introduce our very special guest, I want to tell you that after the program, I'll be back. There's a little more housekeeping to be done, and I'll be telling you about the book signing tonight. So be patient with me as I return. And um, other than that, what can I say? Diana Gabaldone is the number one New York Times best-selling author of the Outlander series, which have delighted and and created wonder for readers since 1991 when her first book was published. So we're thrilled that she's joining us tonight in Sacramento, California. Please join me in welcoming Diana Gabaldon.
Well, there may be 25 million copies of them in the world, but only one author. <laughs> one author who could not make us laugh with this line. No wonder he was so good with horses. <laughs> if I were a horse, I'd let him ride me anywhere. <laughs> Welcome, Diana. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> it is my great honor to be on this stage with you. That's lovely, thank you. I am here representing the fans who are here tonight, and I hope I do them proud. I'm sure you will. <laughs> we have a lovely group of people here this evening. We have some from as far as Utah, wow. and Illinois, and North Carolina. I'm very flattered, thank you. <laughs> I heard that someone was coming from Japan. I don't know if they made it. Really? Um, <laughs> There they are. <laughs> we have some birthday girls here yeah. tonight. Terry Smith, um, happy birthday. Avril Ferguson is turning 80. Wow. <laughs> Joanne Del Porto, nee McEwen, yeah. is 87. Ooh. <laughs> and their, their daughters surprise them with tickets for tonight. So very good children. <laughs> And uh, very nice birthday presents. And we have a couple here, Deborah and Kit, and who just got married. Mm -hmm. uh, Pocket Jamie actually was in attendance at their wedding. Oh. <laughs> um, Kit actually reads her books, uh, reads your books aloud to her. Oh, that's very cool. And uh, has read them all. They are currently on Echo in the Bone. Very nice. <laughs> so I wonder what he does when he gets to the Gallic bits. So, Wing it. I am impressed. Uh -huh. So over time, I have been collecting questions from your local fans, and I'm looking forward to asking you some of them of course. this evening. As Rivka noted, your books are a huge success, but to each of the readers out there, that is not what matters. Sure, it's a good selling point when we're trying to uh, you know, tell our sister or our, our dentist or our neighbor about them, you know, convincing them to read it. But for each of us, there aren't 25 million copies in the world. There is that one book in our hands. And it speaks directly to us. It is ours. It gives us each a unique experience and is our old friend and the home that we keep returning to. And to quote Robert Frost via Claire, <laughs> home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And it takes us in every time. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so we are in a room with fans of your books who have collectively read them thousands of times. Thank you. <laughs> Yet there are many people here who don't know how they came to be. So let's talk about your creative process as, as a writer, and then we'll like. talk yeah. more specifically about the books. Sure. So, um, you know, Claire quoted Lewis Carroll when she said, begin at the beginning. So uh -huh. let's start from the beginning. What, uh, what kind of reader were you as a child? Um, omnivorous from the beginning. I learned to read at the age of three or so and never stopped. I distinctly remember going to kindergarten when I was five, being presented with a copy of C. Dick Run. <laughs> flipping through it and tossing it contemptuously onto the table. <laughs> I was not a tactful child. And uh, saying, who would read that? <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, have read everything that I could get my hands on from the earliest days. I can't remember not being able to read. And uh, one of the happiest days of my life was when uh, my mother wrote a note to the public librarian saying, let her check out anything she wants. <laughs> Excellent. So the, the library uh, uh, was important to you as a child? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I grew up long before the days of e-readers and uh, you know, relatively cheap books. We had a lot of books at home, but many of them were ones that we had inherited from my grandparents and great-grandparents. So I grew up reading a lot of very old-fashioned novels, but I read very fast. You know, I'd read everything we had at home by the time I was 10, and uh, so uh, read my way through the Flagstaff Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But that's a good challenge. Uh, you know, I was a children's librarian until recently and mm -hmm. uh, would have loved to have had you as a, as a reader. Um, <laughs> I kind of no, it's so got exciting. out of the children's section by the time I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> Amazing. So how did you come to start writing Outlander? Well, I had known from about the age of eight that I was meant to be a novelist. Uh, you know, I, I just realized this, and uh, I might have started earlier, but I came from a very conservative family background, 
My father was fond of saying to me, well, you're such a poor judge of character, you're bound to marry some bum, he said. So, uh, <laughs> so be sure you get a good education so you can support your children. <laughs> So with this going on at home, I thought perhaps I would not announce that I wanted to write novels, since this is kind of iffy, financially speaking. And uh, so I went into science. You know, I uh, have a PhD in quantitative behavioral ecology, which is it's just animal behavior with a lot of statistics. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I liked science. I was good at it. I enjoyed research. I liked to teach a lot. But I knew I was supposed to be a novelist. And when I turned 35, I said to myself, well, you know, Mozart was dead at 36. Maybe you better get a move on here. <laughs> And uh, so I said, all right, my next birthday, I will start writing a book. Because up to this point, I had written a lot of everything, <laughs> uh, including a 400-page doctoral dissertation entitled Nest Site Selection in the Pinion J, Gymnorhinus cyanocephalus. <laughs> <laughs> or as my husband says, why birds build nests where they do, and who cares anyway? <laughs> Uh, no, I did not marry a bum. I married a very nice man, whom I still have 42 years later. But uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, but he did quit work three months after our first child was born in order to start his own business. And I do have to say that in terms of financial stability, there's not that much to choose between an entrepreneur and a bum. So. <laughs> So I was obliged to find another way of uh, making extra money. They don't pay assistant professors very much. And so I was looking for a way of earning income without taking up prostitution in the home. And uh, <laughs> now I had I'd sort of slid sideways and become a, quote, expert in scientific computation. It's really easy to be an expert if there's only six people in the world who do okay. what you do, and that was my <laughs> position. Um, so when the need to earn extra money arose, I wrote uh, query letters to Byte and InfoWorld and all the, uh, the PC press. This was the early 1980s. And I enclosed a copy of a scholarly journal that I had founded at the university entitled Science Software Quarterly, and uh, also a copy of a comic book that I'd written for Walt Disney a few years earlier, entitled Nutrition Adventures with Orange Bird. <laughs> it was a really short letter. It said, Dear Sirs, as you can see from the enclosed, you won't find anyone who knows more about scientific and technical software than I do and at the same time can write so as to appeal to a broad popular audience. <laughs> well, it's got immediate results, and within a year I was earning as much freelancing as I was uh, at uh, university. But uh, the point here is that no one ever showed me how to write doctoral dissertations or scholarly articles or uh, software reviews. I just looked at a few examples and wrote one, and if it didn't look quite right, I poked it till it did. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, uh, you've been reading novels for 30 odd years. Surely if I write one, I will recognize it. All right. Um, <laughs> but it seems to me that the only way to learn to write a novel is actually to write a novel. So I said, fine, uh, I'm gonna write a novel. And uh, only two rules. I'm not going to show it to anyone. It's not for publication. I just need to learn how. And uh, so I will write the whole thing, no matter how bad I may think it is, because I need to know what it takes in terms of mental discipline and daily commitment and uh, organization and research and so forth. So I will write the whole thing and know what, it, what goes into one. And uh, my second rule was that I would do the best thing I could every day with the writing. Because if I'm not doing my best, how will I know if I'm any good? Mm -hmm. And how will I get any better? So those were my only two rules. So the next question was, what kind of book should I write? Because I read everything, lots of it. And uh, I said, well, I read a lot of mysteries. Maybe I should write a mystery. And I said, no, mysteries have plots. I'm not sure I can do that. And uh, so I said, what's the easiest possible thing I could write for practice? No point making it hard. And uh, after a bit of thought, I decided perhaps historical fiction would be best. And that's because I was a research professor. I knew my way around a library said it seems easier to look things up than to make them up. And if I turn out to have no imagination, I can steal things from the historical record. <laughs> Which actually works very well, so, apparently. So I said, OK, historical novel, where shall I set this? Because I don't have any background in history, just the six hours of Western civilization they make you take as an undergraduate. So uh, one time would do as well as another. I'd have to look it all up anyway. So I was looking for a convenient time and place, you know, American Civil War, Italian Renaissance. And in this malleable frame of mind, I happened to see a really old Doctor Who rerun on public television. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> I see some of you are familiar with Doctor Who. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who's your favorite doctor? Minus David Tennant. <laughs> yeah, the Christopher Eccleston was very good too. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, this was a really old. Uh, one. Uh, for those who may not know who Doctor Who is, it's a really old, long-running show done in the, in the UK, originally for children. It's been running for 60 years or more. And the doctor of the title is a time lord from the planet Gallifrey, who travels through space and time, having adventures. And along the way, he picks up companions from different periods of Earth's history. Well, in this really old show, it was one of the Patrick Troughton episodes, uh, he had picked up a young Scotsman from 1745. And this was a young man, 1819, who appeared in his kilt. And I said, well, that's kind of fetching. <laughs> and uh, I found myself still thinking about this the next day. Uh, <laughs> in church. And I said, uh, <laughs> and I said uh, well, you've got to start somewhere. You know, why not Scotland, 18th century? So that's where I began. Uh, knowing nothing about Scotland or the 18th century, having no plot, no outline, and no characters, uh, nothing but the rather vague images conjured up by the notion of a man in a kilt. <laughs> Which, as uh, those of you who have seen Stephanie's husband realize, is a very powerful and compelling image. <laughs> yes, I don't know whether he's in the audience or hiding somewhere, but, <laughs> but for his sake, we'll hope he's conveniently concealed by darkness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not too conveniently. <laughs> yes, well, uh, you know, my sixth book, A Breath of Snow and Ashes, was very fortunate. It uh, opened at number one on the bestseller lists of several countries. <laughs> But it also won me several prizes, including a Quill Award for, and I quote, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. <laughs> <laughs> for which I beat out both George R.R. R. Martin and Stephen King. <laughs> But it also won me the Corina International Prize for Fiction, which was very cool. And I got to go to Germany to accept this on Bavarian television, which was an adventure in itself. But uh, while I was there, the publisher had me interviewed by everyone in the German press, from tabloid newspapers up to the equivalent of Vanity Fair. And uh, toward the end of the very long week, I was talking to a nice young man from a literary journal. He was saying, oh, I've read all of your books. You know, your, your imagery is tremendous. Your characters are just uh, three-dimensional. Three and your narrative drive is just, uh, you know, just amazing. And I'm going, yes, yes, go on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Steady stopped. And he said, uh, there's just this one thing, I wonder. Could you explain to me what is the appeal of a man in a kilt? <laughs> well, he was a German, you know. And, uh, Anyway, I was really tired, or I might not have said it, but I just looked at him for a minute, and I said, well, I suppose it's the idea that you could be up against a wall with him in a minute. <laughs> well, you know, the uh, young actor playing Jamie Fraser in the TV show, his name is Sam Hugh, and I told him that story, and he turned white. <laughs> Then he turned red. <laughs> and then he started wearing his kilt everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, as I say, very powerful and compelling image. So yeah, anyway, that's where I started. <laughs> it, it's, it certainly is. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what do I got in there? <laughs> May need to turn a few pages. <laughs> so, um, no, I just have an image of a kilt in my head. Excuse yeah. me. Um, so what if that episode of Doctor Who hadn't have aired that night? Would we be here talking about a novel based in ancient Rome or turn of the century New York, do you think? It might have been, yeah. yeah it was uh, you know, just uh, luck of the draw. <laughs> well, we're happy with the way it turned out. Yeah. Um, you know, let's go back to Pinion Jays. Sure. <laughs> So, um, so you were a scientist before you were a fiction writer? I was, And yeah. you, uh -huh. you still do write about birds, but not scientifically. We see them in your novels. Sure. Mm -hmm. You focus on the human element, uh, the plover as mother, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the gray-lag goose as a mate, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. the thrush as a singer, like Roger mm -hmm. the thrush. Yeah. Uh -huh. So pinion jays are a beautiful shade of blue that I've seen yeah. you wear mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, can you tell us one fascinating fact about pinion jays? Ah, mm -hmm. I can tell you lots about pinion jays, but uh, uh, I do know why they build nests where they do. Uh, they build. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, studied them for five years, or rather I had five years worth of data. They are gregarious nesters, and that means that they nest colonially, all the nests will be in the same neighborhood. So once you've found one, you, you can go around looking at all the trees nearby, and eventually you found the whole flock. They were all color banded, this flock, so we could tell when we'd found everybody. And uh, so I would map them and took pictures of their trees and all kinds of things, was testing various hypotheses. What turned out to be the case, though, was that they were nesting very near roads in all every year. Yeah. And when you were wondering, why? You know, why would they do that? Wouldn't it be disturbing having traffic? And we thought for a bit maybe they're eating roadkill because they're very omnivorous. They will eat anything. But yeah, there's not enough roadkill for the whole flock to be doing that. And uh, actually what it turns out to be, pinion jays are very early nesters because they get their name because they harvest uh, the pinion nuts off a pinion tree. Don't ask me why the tree is pinion and the bird is pinion. It was probably a non-Spanish speaking person who named the bird. But no. <laughs> anyway, they, they bury the nuts in the, in the fall and then they find them again in the spring. So they have a food supply earlier than the other birds. And uh, so what I wondered was, are they feeding the kids pinion nuts? And so we uh, went up to the nests, extracted the young, you know, washed their gullets out with the, with the sterile water so we could see what they were eating. And no, they're feeding the, the young uh, insects. And I said, OK. So I uh, took a sweep net and went along the roadside verges taking samples. And then I went along in the open forest taking the same sort of samples. Sure enough, there's 10 times more bugs along the roadside verges than there are in the forest. <laughs> and that's because it snows in the spring in, uh, in Flagstaff. And the ver roadside verges are where the snow melts first. So that's where you get a growth of weeds. That's where you get bugs. That's where you get pinion jays. <laughs> <laughs> I like learning science from you. Thank mm. you. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> so I know you don't write from the beginning of the story to the end. No. Do you remember the first line or scene that you wrote that made it into the Outlander that we know today? Oh, yeah, the first one that made it into the uh, Outlander. The first couple of days I was just writing to you know, get words on paper. I had no idea where I was going or what was happening. but. Um, I, uh, about the third day of writing, I said, well, we must have a lot of Scotsmen, of course, because of the kilt factor. But um, I think it would be a good idea if we had a woman to play off these guys, and we'll have sexual tension. That's conflict. That's good. This was the only thing I knew about uh, novels, was that they should have conflict. And uh, that's why I chose the Jacobite Rising. I said, that looks like a lot of conflict. Fine. Um, so I said, well, essentially, we've got Scots versus English here. If I make her an English woman, we'll have lots of conflict. Uh, which we did, but I uh, introduced this English woman into the story, not knowing who she was, how she got there, what she was doing in the plot, but I loosed her into a cottage full of Scotsmen to see what she'd do. Now she walked in, they're all sitting around the hearth muttering to each other, and one of them drew himself up and he said, my name's Dougal Mackenzie, and uh, who might you be? And without my stopping to think, I just typed, my name's Claire Elizabeth Beecham, and who the hell are you? <laughs> and I said, well, you don't sound at all like an 18th century person. So I fought with her for several pages, trying to beat her into shape and make her talk like a historical person. <laughs> she wasn't having any of this. Yeah. She just kept making smart-ass modern remarks. And uh, she also took over and started telling the story herself. <laughs> so I said, I'm not going to fight with you all the way through this book. I said, no one's ever going to see this. It doesn't matter what bizarre thing I do. Go ahead and be modern. I'll figure out how you got there later. So it's all her fault that there's time travel in these books. <laughs> As, usually we, as usual, we can blame Claire for a lot of things. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad she did it. So um, let's talk a bit about your creative process then. Sure. Yeah. What, um, what's a typical day of writing for you? Uh, it depends where I am in a book. Uh, the, the main big books of the series take two to three years to write. Uh, they're very large. They're very complex. They get more complex as we go through the series because uh, I can't count on people realizing that it is a large series when they see a new book. You know, especially it's airports and things like that. There's only the most recent book, and people, you know, passing by on their way to Cleveland will just grab it because it looks interesting. It's a big book; it'll last them. They don't realize it's the eighth book of the series. 
So that book has to be understandable enough for them to enjoy that book without having read the earlier ones. So that takes a lot of interior engineering to do that while not boring the people who have read the first seven books. So it, it, it takes more time as I go along. The other thing is that I come and do things like this instead of staying home and writing. And uh, yeah, that takes about, there's about a year of promotion built into my schedule that didn't used to be there. So uh, it's all your fault. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yes. But anyway, uh, toward the beginning of a book, I, I don't plan the books out ahead of time. I don't work with an outline. And as you know, I don't write in a straight line. So in the beginning, I don't know anything about this book except you know some of the people who are in it. And so I will be doing a lot of research and a lot of thinking. And I, I write every day, because if you don't, the inertia builds up on you and it's hard to start again. And so I, I will write something every day. And uh, I'll aim for 1,000 words. But in the beginning, I may be only getting 500 words a day. That's OK. As we move along into it, though, you know, after two or three months, I will have gotten kind of a grip on myself. I'll be oriented in terms of uh, you know, location, the geographical areas that I'm dealing with, and to uh, some extent, you know, the historical events. And uh, so I'll continue doing the research and the writing concurrently. But over time, it shifts. So I will be doing more writing and less research. Uh, what I call my walking pace is 1,000 words a day. And uh, it, some days that I can do that in two hours. Some days it takes four or five. And some days it's just not happening. <laughs> so uh, you do your best. So in a given day, I write usually in the middle of the night. From midnight to 4.30 is my, my main time. I uh, started doing this when I had three small children and was writing for a living. But uh, I do uh, get up around uh, 9 in the morning. My husband's uh, an early bird, luckily. He gets up around 5.30, so we actually share a bed for about an hour every night. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I get up around 9 and you know, take the dogs out and uh, get a Diet Coke and you know, some cheese and nuts for breakfast and go upstairs and answer my email. And uh, you know, by 11 or so, I'm compost medicine enough to begin working. So I will you know, try to get something on paper before lunch. My husband comes home for lunch, bringing with him the scene that I wrote the night before and will tell me what he thought of it. He's got a good oh. literary eye, which is very good. He's the the only person who sees what I'm working on while I'm working on it. That's fascinating. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's very good. You know, I will not leave a scene until I think it's as good as I can make it. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily perfect. And, you know, sometimes I'll give him something and I'll say, I'll know there's some, I know there's something wrong in here, but I'm not quite sure what it is. He can always tell me what it is. I'll mm -hmm. say, it's right here. You know, this, this particular person wouldn't say that at, you know, under these particular circumstances. And I say, huh, OK, well, in that case, let me think what to do. You know, shall I just eliminate his saying that? Or, you know, uh, you being a man, you know, what would you say under the circumstances? <laughs> and so forth. Then, you know, I, I work out what to do about it. But he can pinpoint the problem for me. Um, so anyway, then I go back to work after lunch for an hour or so. Then I go to run the uh, household errands, you know, dry cleaning, take the dog to the vet, do the grocery shopping, come back, do my gardening, do my exercise. I try to walk from two to five miles a day, depending on time and the weather. And uh, then I cook dinner, and uh, we you know, mess around for a while after dinner, just being social, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I said we share a bed to sleep for an hour or so every night. Yeah. Anyway, um, as people say, when I published uh, Voyager, a lot of people said, well, why are you writing about these people in their 40s? No one wants to hear about people in their 40s having sex. And I said, what a bet. Yes. Anyway, then uh, I'll lie down on the couch with the dogs. I've got two big, fat, standard dachshunds who are very cuddly, and a book. And uh, you know, if there's no alarms in the night, and these days there aren't because the kids are 32, 30, and 28, um, I'll fall asleep within 10 minutes. And uh, the dogs and I slumber peacefully till around midnight, 12:30. And then we get up and stagger off to the office with another diet coke and a couple of bones, and uh, and uh, we work the night shift. And that's how it goes. <laughs> Um, you actually, uh, in A Breath of Snow and Ashes, um, Claire um, says, well, what happens is the second sleep. You fall asleep from tiredness soon after dark, but then wake again, rising from the surface of your dreams like a trout coming up to feed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds very autobiographical there. Yes, well, that's actually a matter of, uh, of record. If you go back and look, uh, that's what they did in the 18th century, because they didn't have electric lights and uh, you know, to save candles and so forth. And because they were really tired from all the labor, they went to bed after the sun went down. But they would wake up you know, three, four or five hours later. They'd get up you know, 
know, have a small meal, you know, be, be social. Sometimes people would even go visit the neighbors in the middle of the night because everybody was doing this, you know, and then, you know, they'd just sit by the hearth fire, you know, without lighting a lot of expensive candles and, you know, chat or knit or whatever. And then when they got tired again after two or three hours, they'd go back to bed and sleep until dawn when they'd get up and go to work. <laughs> now, since you don't write chronologically, you, you skip around. Mm -hmm. um, most of your books are chronological, maybe on two planes. Um, but Dragonfly in Amber actually does, maybe it resembles more your writing style, um, because it does skip around. We're going back well, and forth. And well, yes and no. Um, all of the books have a unique structure and a unique shape. Uh, if I tell you what the shape is, you would be able to recognize it, but otherwise you wouldn't. Um, Outlander, for instance, is three overlapping triangles. It's got three climaxes. The first, when Jamie finds out who and what she is after the witch trial and takes her back to the stone circle where she makes her choice as to where to stay or whether to stay or go. The second is when she rescues him from Wentworth. And the third is when she saves his soul at the Abbey after that. So it's got these three mm -hmm. things. Um, Dragonfly in Amber is, is shaped like a dumbbell. It's, uh, it's got... Uh, a framing story on either end, which is told from Roger Wakefield's third person point of view, whereas all of Outlander is in Claire's first person. Okay, after that beginning framing story with Roger, where he's dealing with Claire and Brianna, who have come to, uh, to find out what happened to the men of Lollybrock, then uh, there's a flashback uh, when they find Jamie's grave, and Claire begins to tell Brianna, and by extension Roger, what happened. And so she describes this arc in Paris of the political intrigue that led up to the rising and what was going on and how they were trying to stop it. And then uh, they go to Lollybrock, which is this long sort of tranquil segment in the middle, that's the, be the bar of the barbell. And, uh, and of course they are not able to stop Prince Charlie, and uh, Jamie is obliged to go and fight, and then there's the second arc, which deals with the actual battles of the Rising and what happened, and Claire knows, of course, about Culloden, what's going to happen, and various things happen, and uh, you know, the, that, it comes down to the, the last bitter end, and the best Jamie can do is to save his men, and he takes her to the stones to send her back, and that's the end there, and then there's the framing story, which tells what happened uh, back in the, in the future. So in fact, there's just that sort segment front and back that are the nuts holding the story together. And that's in uh, Roger's third person. Voyager is shaped like a horse's tail. It's got a braided narrative because we open with Jamie's point of view. In fact, he thinks he's dead on Culloden Field, mm -hmm. and uh, even though he, his nose throbs, which he thinks peculiar in the circumstances. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he's telling his story forward because that's how he's living it. Meanwhile, Claire is back in the past with Roger and Brianna. She's flashing back and telling her story backward, mm -hmm. essentially. And Roger's third person point of view is in there serving as the turning point between those two narratives with his detective work into the past. And so those three narratives are crisscrossing until Claire goes back, at which point it falls back into her first person narrative, like a braided horse's tail. So anyway, they're all with, with unique things. But someone pointed out to me around the fourth book that I was, in fact, adding a new viewpoint character with each book, which, in fact, I was. <laughs> so, uh, and yes, there are eight in this one. <laughs> um, actually, Rhonda Franz, she's a colleague of mine, she asks uh, how you keep everything in order and um, all the projects that you're working on. I mean, you're not only writing um, you know, the one book, but mm -hmm. perhaps other projects, and yes, also you have so many ideas. How mm -hmm. do you keep everything in order? I actually think I have a very benign form of ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, fairly recently read a quiz in the newspaper, you know, how to tell if you have ADD or ADHD. And you know, it had all these questions, uh, which I answered. But I could see that half of them dealt with uh, attention issues. It was like, do you constantly feel like you're watching a television channel with a uh, television set with eight channels going at once? And I was going, yes, doesn't everyone? <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, that ideas are whizzing past your head. I'm saying, yeah, of course. And the other half had to deal with anger management. You know, are you very irritable? Do you, you know, bite pieces? out of people, can you not stand delay? And, and I answered all of those, no. So that's why I say it's probably a fairly benign form. But, but yeah, I, I actually do think on multiple levels pretty much all of the time. We were discussing this a little bit backstage, and you know, women with children, they always multitask because you don't have any choice, you know, you, you have to. Uh, men have the luxury of just concentrating on one thing at a time, but uh, yeah. But you know, I've, I've never 
I can't say I've never been able to concentrate on one thing at a, at a time because I can, but it takes uh, either a really good book or an absorbing movie, the act of writing, or sex. Any of those will kind of focus my attention. <laughs> But this system works for you, yeah. and um, you identified that you know that it that it was fine, and, and thank goodness because we get a, a lot of wonderful things from out of the well. I don't want to say chaos, but uh, <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, no, it totally is. <laughs> um, Susan Wyasek Wyasek asks, uh, what was the hardest piece of constructive criticism? to accept that resonated with you and helped you to become the author that you are today? I don't think anybody ever has constructively criticized me. <laughs> well, I, well, I understand. Except for my husband, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, and you know, it's, well, <laughs> I, I don't know if it's the most useful, but his most memorable bit of uh, criticism was a marginal note that said, nipples again. <laughs> A friend of mine considers nipples a character in the, yeah. uh, in the book. <laughs> well, you know, it was a time when people breastfed, you know, they were just right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> coming back to libraries. <laughs> so where, where did you do your research? Many have asked if you did it in Scotland. Well, no, because I wasn't telling anyone that I was writing a book to start with, including my husband, because he would have tried to stop me. Uh, <laughs> Not out of any objection to my writing a book, but out of fear that I would drop dead, since I had wow. at the time two full-time jobs and three small children. And he would have said, you know, wait until the kids are in school, you know, wait till my business is doing better and you can quit one of your jobs. And I just knew if I didn't do it right now, I might not ever do it, so I didn't tell him. And uh, let's see. I've lost track of what the question libraries. was. Um, yeah, libraries. <laughs> your, well, your research. Of course, oh, research, your husband. Yes, of um, course, and my husband, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I couldn't very well announce that I had to go to Scotland to do research since I wasn't telling that I was writing a book. Sure, and a I couldn't have afforded it anyway. No, I uh, began uh, doing my research in the university library. I was a, a, a professor at Arizona State, and it's quite a large library. as the international library loan system, which is very useful. Oh, yeah, so yes. I could get hold of almost anything if I knew it, was, it existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, then the internet uh, actually developed into a usable resource, but not for many years. Um, I've I've heard you say that um, um, you did your research in a library, but the one aspect you couldn't learn from a book is the smells of Scotland. Yeah. And um, my colleague Sherry Nicolini, and also my sister Kristen Bennett, and um, Odo Rhino Laryngologist asks, you include a lot of detail about smells in your novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Claire especially seems to have a very keen sense of smell. Mm -hmm. I imagine that you do as well. Apparently I do. I mean, yeah, it's hard to compare it to anyone else's oh, because yeah. I can't tell what they smell, but you know. If, <laughs> it's a, a very vivid, I don't know if I can call it imagery. <laughs> well, yes, it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. So no, it, um, there's actually a, a technique called the rule of three. There's actually two rules of three, but the sensory one is one I learned from Gustave Flaubert, who actually bothered to write it down. And what he said was, if you use any three of the five senses in a scene, that will immediately bring it to life. It will make it seem very vivid and three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, most people who don't know that only use two. They'll use, you know, sight and sound. People are seeing things and they're listening to things. But, and they you know, will get into touch when they do sex scenes, but at that point they usually stop talking, so they're still only with two. And, uh, no, but if you include smell, which is one of the easiest things to include, you know, uh, when Claire kisses Jamie, you know, she, uh, she always, you know, either tastes or smells what he's been eating, because, I mean, you do. <laughs> so. Um, I find it interesting that you don't swear, but don't Claire swear. swears like a sailor. Yes, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Your books deal with the good and bad of sex, politics, and religion. Is there one subject you would never write about? Uh, let's see. Um, hmm. I can't think of anything that I wouldn't write about. Yeah, that's yeah, about right. The swearing, you know. I, uh, <laughs> I went to a parochial school, and you know, my parents were you know, very clean-spoken. They made the worst my father would ever say was crap, and then only if terribly upset. So, and so I, I just, uh, I, I cannot, I, I, 
Yeah, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, do you think that's what uh, Claire was when she first appeared? Maybe she, uh, yeah, she's my alter ego. ego. She could vicariously say anything. through yeah. her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's extremely funny to me because I, I see some of the footage from the television show and it's very entertaining to see how frequently even very professional, very accomplished actors, you know, forget their lines or turn around in the wrong place or something. <laughs> Invariably, the, the, the younger ones will, you know, strike themselves in the head and say, oh, F word, you know, <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> Probably nobody else thinks that's funny, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so Christine uh, Brown Kitamura writes, I find reading the Outlander series with a dictionary next to me helpful. Mm -hmm. As you sprinkle high lexile level words, and of course those other four letter words throughout your stories uh, that stretch my vocabulary, do you stash away Sunday words as you encounter them and um, to plug into your future books? Do you just find words that you love and just have to include them? <laughs> I've been a notorious word drunk from the age of five or so when I discovered the dictionary. No, I just, uh, I just pick up words everywhere. And your favorite word? Uh, absquatulate. Absquatulate. I love it. Has, has a good cue in it. Um, your heart-wrenching scenes conjure up strong emotions in your readers. Do they affect you in the same way when writing them? And how do you write difficult scenes? Yeah, well, they'd better, or they wouldn't get through to the, uh, to the uh, readers that way. Um, there's two parts to writing, and uh, the craft part, you know, how to actually depict something on the page. You can teach people to do that. I don't know if you can teach them to find uh, the pieces of a story. I was luckily born with it, uh, but I don't know that everybody is. It may be possible to learn to do that. But I do know that uh, you have to write very honestly or it's not going to come across uh, in that way. And I know a lot of dishonest writers, uh, which I, I tend not to read their books after the first one. But, uh, you know, they're, they're rather facile. They avoid, you know, an emotional engagement with a subject. And that may be personal discomfort or just that they don't want to go to the trouble because it is a lot of trouble to do that. Mm -hmm. um, no, those are very deeply emotional scenes for me, and usually I write them late at night because it really disturbs my family to come in and find me with tears rolling down my face. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, some of them uh, that I know are coming, for instance, like Claire's uh, farewell letter to Brianna when she went back. You know, I knew she had to write that letter, um, but yeah, I didn't know how, didn't know what was in it. And those scenes I'll just kind of live with for a long time and uh, you know I, I'm not even thinking about them consciously but you know something is, is accreting or building up there and then one day you know I call it the words show up you know I'll, I'll suddenly have a phrase or a line of dialogue or you know just something with words and once the words have shown up then I can sit down and it usually will, will come out very quickly at that point. Mm -hmm. Well they um, I mean they're very we, we can sense when they're coming as well mm -hmm. And um, not all of them, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> As in, my husband is fond of also writing in the margins occasionally. Oh, they're going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few places like that in this book. <laughs> you have said that when you write, your characters show up for work. And I have to yeah. say, you must have been in hysterics when Herman and Vermin walked into the room. <laughs> I love Herman and Vermin. So who are some of your favorite walk-ons? Oh, um, uh -huh. Yeah, well, mushrooms and so forth. Mr. Willoughby, the, the uh, little Chinese foot fetishist in Dragonfly and Amber is, is uh, definitely a mushroom. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he was actually... Um, the fruit of an unholy union between uh, my need to get Jamie across the sea without dying of seasickness. Oh, yes. And I said, you know, what could poss they possibly have used in the 18th century? Uh, you know, ginger was available, but only as an expensive import. It wouldn't be easy to find, and I'm not sure it would work that well on him anyway. So what else was there? Well, acupuncture was the only thing that I could think of that was likely to be very effective, and also picturesque, you know, what with the spine <laughs> sticking out of his head and all that. So I said, okay, how is Claire going to you know, learn acupuncture in the 18th century? Well, there were Chinese people in the 18th century, and they certainly knew how. It was a, an old technique. I just had to get one of them in Scotland. And <laughs> not really a problem. Uh, but at about the same time, while I was sort of thinking along these lines, I, I pick up books off remainder tables all the time. And I picked up one day this very sprightly volume called The Sex Life of the Foot and Shoe. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> fascinating. So it's all about foot fetishism, <laughs> which is extremely entertaining. Um, 
there was so, some parts of it were rather horrifying, uh, especially the one about foot binding in China. Um, because you know how that's done, I expect. You take a small girl and you bend her toes under and bandage the foot tightly. And then as she grows older, you bend them further and her toes rot and fall off. And you eventually end up with a foot that looks like that. Okay, the question is, why would anybody do that? What are you looking at there? <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> that's just why they do that. <laughs> Not kidding. So having seen that, you know, that, that uh, kind of added to Mr. Willoughby's character. <laughs> so he, he might have been... <laughs> Slow on the uptake over there. Yeah, I am, I am. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, Not you, her. <laughs> um, so are there any uh, characters who signed up for a bit part but became major characters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, there's uh, Lord John Gray. He's what you might call my... Yeah, what you might call my most successful mushroom. <laughs> he popped up out of nowhere in Dragonfly and Amber, and I never expected to see him again. Mm -hmm. And bang, there he was again in Voyager. And he sort of, you know, kind of moved in and made himself at home. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he, he talks to me you know, immediately without hesitation. I never have to think what he would say in one of his scenes. <laughs> so he, he talks to you. Um, mm -hmm. So do you identify with him, or which character do you most identify with? Um, there is a group of fans in Phoenix where I live who takes me out to tea once in a while to pick my brains about the new book coming up. And on one of these occasions, they got started on the character of Black Jack Randall. They're saying, oh, he's so loathsome, he's such scum, he makes my skin crawl. And I'm sitting there sipping my tea and thinking, you have no idea you're talking to Black Jack Randall, do you? Okay, so that answers the question. <laughs> Now, is that, do you think, because he manipulates Jamie's story, or...? Um... No, I'm a natural-born sadist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We do appreciate it. <laughs> so, um... Roger is fascinated with Claire's story. He's a historian. Mm -hmm. He chooses to go back in time. Mm -hmm. He's starstruck by Jamie. Mm -hmm. he, perhaps he's in love with Claire. Mm -hmm. He never fits in. He can never relax and just be, and is the ultimate interloper. Mm -hmm. Did you write Roger to represent the reader, or am I simply revealing that I, ident I identified with, with yeah. Roger? Yeah, okay. no, he wasn't constructed for any particular reason. It was just who he was, you know. he's. Uh, a man who grew up, you know, essentially without parents, though he did have an adoptive great uncle who, you know, was affectionate and so forth. He does understand relationships, but he didn't grow up with, a, with his nuclear family. And, of course, he's always missing his parents and wondering, you know, what would they have been like? What would life have been like with them? And also, uh, he is rather inconveniently burdened with a, uh, with a calling. You know, he never wanted to be a minister, but he is becoming aware that that's what he's supposed to be. And he has no idea how to go about it. And... Uh, and yet then to uh, be wondering how to do this and to find himself in the 18th century where, you know, he's, he's got skills, he's a manly man, but he doesn't have 18th century skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so always feel like you're, you're fumbling along in the wake of, of your uh, studly father-in-law. That can't be good. <laughs> so none of your characters are perfect and no. each of them are <laughs> flawed, but whom do you most admire of your characters? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably not Blackjack. Uh, no, no, he's not very admirable, I'm afraid. Uh, he's deeply honest, though. He knows who and what he is, you know, which it actually adds to his tragedy. He does know what he is, uh, but uh, yet he can't, can't help it. Um, no, I suppose I admire Jamie more than, uh, than, than most, but you know, I admire all of them. We like Jamie, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you mentioned Sam Hewen who plays uh, Jamie in the mm -hmm. Stars mm -hmm. television production, and you call him Shugs because your son is named Sam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, however, you gave Jenny Murray your daughter's name. Uh, well, it, it just didn't occur to me. Uh, see, my daughter's name is Jennifer, and uh, Jenny Murray's Janet, name is I actually Janet. Right. It's just You're that right. that would have been the Scottish diminutive of, of Janet, which is a very common Scottish name. So I came at it from the other end. <laughs> 
So you, you did mention um, Roger losing his parents and trying to fit in. Well, many of your characters are orphans. Yes, uh -huh, they are. That's partly because it gets much more complicated if you have a lot of uh, family hanging around. I guess, hanging I around. guess so. We have, I guess we have enough characters. Okay. <laughs> but uh, Claire and Jamie seem to take on the role of mother and father both literally and figuratively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it was fairly common in the 18th century because there was a lot of Short death. Life you know? expectancy. <laughs> and so there was a great deal of you know, blended familyism and fostering and so forth. Fostering was very common in the highlands, in fact. It was uh, sort of the normal thing to do for you know, to export your, your young teenage son to a different clan. <laughs> which, you know, probably was good for the peace of the home, you know, because <laughs> he's much more likely to behave if he's somewhere else okay. with a, a lot of large, ferocious men who can beat him into shape. <laughs> <laughs> so Jamie asks of Claire, why do you talk to yourself? And she responds, it assures me of a good listener. <laughs> um, well, when you read your own books, you can be assured of a, a good reader. Do you read your own books? Oh, yeah. No, I always read a new book when it comes back from the printer. They will send me, like, the first copy off the presses, and I will immediately take it out of its wrappings and smell it, you know, and fondle it. And I, I, you know, I usually carry it around with me for several days, you know, petting it at stoplights. And, and, uh, yeah. and they're, they're, they're about the same weight as yeah. a newborn, right? Yeah, yeah very much. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, no, because uh, when it left my hands, it was not yet a book, and now it is. So I always sit down and read it through. Also, because of the odd way that I work, I, I glue bits and pieces together, and usually it isn't a complete contiguous thing until quite soon before it's printed. And so I'm still thinking of it in terms of its, of its patchwork, of its shape. I haven't yet experienced it as a single mm -hmm. contiguous story, so it's, uh, it's fun to do that. And also I pick up any typos that got in during the copy edit. <laughs> and of course we can't pick our favorites of our children, but what about your books? Which, uh, which books are your... Well, it's always either the one I'm working on or the one I have just finished. So at the moment it's, it's Moby. <laughs> well, excellent. I can't wait to enjoy it myself. Uh, so who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, let me see. Uh, I have literally dozens because you know, I've been reading for the last 59 years. Uh, but uh, let's see, my five literary role models, these are the five uh, authors whose techniques I actually attempted to emulate while I was writing Outlander. And there's Charles Dickens, from whom I learned uh, characters, you know, how to create a very vivid character and how to describe them and how to catch them in their dialect. And uh, let's see. And then there's Robert Louis Stevenson, from whom I learned the art of, you know, just telling a good tale, you know, the narrative uh, velocity, I guess you'd say. Though he also is very good at a very economical depiction of characters, you know, along John Silver and Blind Pew and so forth. And uh, then there's Dorothy Lee Sayers, also an excellent uh, judge of character, but from her I learned uh, not only the use of dialogue and dialect, but of social class and the nuances of social interaction, and also how to construct a fairly watertight plot. And uh, let's see, then there's John D. MacDonald, a thriller writer, from whom I learned uh, you know, both narrative drive and how to maintain a series character over a stretch of, I think he wrote 30 Travis McGee novels. Mm. So how do you pick up a character that uh, this may be the first encounter that a reader has with him, but you may have a, a long history with him. How do you describe him in the 28th book and in a way that will you know, make him vivid but not boring? And that's, a, that's as I say, a difficult thing to do. I, oh, and the fifth one is P.G. Woodhouse, from whom oh. I learned you know, just how to, how to juggle language. <laughs> I, I did have a question from, from um, one of your local fans. I'm sorry, I can't find her. Oh, um, uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. I, I can't find her name, but um, are there any plots or characters that you started, um, started with that have just proved to be very difficult to maintain? I mean, you still enjoy them, but um, they are, uh, they're just, they prove to be trouble. Uh, no, no, I don't think so. But as I say, it's, it's a function of how I write, as in I'm not working in a linear fashion. And, you know, I may have started, you know, a scene that, that just doesn't go anywhere, which is fine. You know, I just abandon it and start over somewhere else in a different scene, probably with a different character. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's like half a page at the most, and uh, sometimes it'll come back, you know. I'll find out where it plugs in later in the story and bring it back mm -hmm. up. If it doesn't, then that's fine. There are usually one or two, you know, short bits like that that just don't fit in the book, but you know, it, it, it's not a problem. You just abandon them. 
So that was Vera. So Vera, thank oh, okay. you very thank much. You, Vera. <laughs> <laughs> and Teresa Carlson asks, I wonder how far had you thought when you wrote that first book? Did, had, had you have imagined this, this world of Outlander, mm -hmm. and it's taken you through eight novels and mm -hmm. uh, three, three uh, Lord John books and several mm -hmm. bulges and hopefully yeah. more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> was was the, the, the story of Outlander, uh, has, has it changed at all um, throughout the process of writing all the novels? Have you had the whole storyline in your head the whole time? Well, people often ask me that. They say, oh, is the story just with you for years and years? Because I suppose that's how they think of stories. No, no, I mean, totally. There was nothing in my head but a man in a kilt when I started. And <laughs> it, it evolves, you know. And uh, now that I'm in the eighth book and so forth, of course, there is this, this history. I've got the preceding seven books. Uh, and to some extent, you know, the character's circumstances will dictate what they might do in the next book, but they don't limit it in any way. And I, I truly don't plan the books out ahead of time. People keep saying, oh, well, you, have you written down the ending, you know, in case you get run over by a bus? No, you better just hope I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this is not good to know because then you can enjoy them as we do. Well, exactly. Yeah, I discover them every day. If I knew what was going to happen, it would not be fun. I think that's delightful. Um, let's talk a bit about the Stars television series, which mm -hmm. will air in the U.S. on August 9th. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. It uh, is, yeah. <laughs> you already have a great readership, but now your fandom will cross over into other media. And yeah, well, that may be a little bit dangerous. I was uh, having lunch with, uh, with Sam and Katrina, who plays uh, Claire. She's wonderful. Uh, they both are. They're just terrific. Uh, but uh, we were having lunch after the Television Critics Association, and I was sort of giving them the short course on how to be famous in 10 easy lessons or less. But uh, anyway, yeah. yeah to the extent that any of us is. But, I mean, they will be. <laughs> Luckily, I am not that visible. But I mean, there's things, uh, for instance, when uh, Sam was the first one cast, you know, and, and he's a very amiable uh, young gentleman and was on Twitter and so forth. And uh, he was picking up all this stuff that my fans were saying. And he emailed me and he said, your fans are crazy. <laughs> He said, how do you deal with this? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, they're, they're benign, you know, for the most part. But uh, I said, there is actually an algorithm for dealing with social media, and I will teach you what it is. <laughs> so I did, and he, he does it very well. But uh, I was talking to them about it, and I said, you know, to this point, you know, the reception that you've gotten has been wonderful. You know, everybody loves you. They've taken you to their hearts. They will uh, totally like it. Sam said early on, after this you know, outpouring of uh, affection, he wrote again to me and he said, what do you think they'll do when they actually see the show? <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I said, well, either they'll collectively wet their pants or, uh, <laughs> or they'll, you know, have torchlight parades down the street and demanding Ron's head on a pike if they don't think it was good. <laughs> I said, but, you know, uh, to this point, we've been protected by the fact that the books are very large and very complex. So people who are, you know, mentally ill or seriously deranged just don't have the attention span to read them. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean this is this is totally true. I've never had a you know a, a total nut. I get kind of benign nuts, but you know they they have they tend to be OCD rather than deranged, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they're very valuable on occasion. But uh, I said, you know, once the TV show comes out, that filter is removed. You know, you especially, but all of us, will be exposed to anybody who can turn on a set. And there are a lot of nuts in the world who can watch TV. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to change. <laughs> so I understand that your children have not read your books. No, they have not. <laughs> but now that your, your story is being filtered through script writers and you can chalk things up to uh, uh, you know, the script uh -huh. writers, do you think your kids are going to watch yeah, the I TV show? Yeah, I think they'll probably watch the TV show. Yeah, what my eldest daughter said was, I don't want to read sex scenes written by my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Which I said, perfectly fine, darling. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, they are further deterred by the fact that Jamie Fraser is six foot four with red hair and so is their father. <laughs> I just have a couple more questions to ask. Um, Elsa Knudsen asks, will there be another book after this one? And if so, how many more can we anticipate? She says, I'm 61 and want to be around to finish the series. <laughs> Well, 
I tell you what else, and I'm 62, so you know, take your vitamins. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, there is at least one more after this one because I'm not through with the story. <laughs> but again, I don't plan the books out. I don't have no idea how many more there might be. I think it's only one, but then I've been thinking that for a long time, and it's always more. So, you know, no, no guarantees. But there certainly will be a book nine. <laughs> Do you have any plans on focusing on any other characters with bulges? I've had a lot of questions about Claire's parents, perhaps, oh. or. Mm -hmm. Um, might be. I mean, there's a, a huge number of characters whose backstories or side stories I could tell. And I do occasionally, if any of you have read The Space Between, you will have seen a couple of you know, very minor characters from the main books, uh, but who nonetheless had a fascinating story to tell. And I did tell the story of Roger's parents because his, what happened to his father was something of a mystery. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Claire's parents are not a mystery, and in fact they've never talked to me, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, in the fullness of time, though, there will be at least a small book entitled What Frank Knew. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh. That is good news. He has no idea when I'll get to that, though. <laughs> He's a man who keeps his secrets. <laughs> uh, your characters have been with you for many years, and mm -hmm. you bring them life. When you have closed the book on Outlander, I'm sorry, we, yes, we must think of this. Will you miss them or will you feel that, like Jamie, you will have served them well and yeah. can let them go in peace? Yeah, no, it, uh, you know, somebody said, are you sad, you know, when you finish a book, is it like postpartum let down? I said, no, no, A, it's a tremendous relief for one thing. But, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's construction. It's like building this very interesting edifice that's got, you know, you know, underpinnings and structural elements, but it's also got decorations and bits and pieces. And, you know, I'm just concentrating, you know, it's like when you're sewing a dress and so forth. Uh, you know, you've, you've knitted the, the lace for your sleeves and you put in this beautiful ruching all around the, uh, the sleeves and so forth, and all by hand, and so forth. Uh, were you sad when you finished that dress, or were you thankful? Oh my goodness, I was. <laughs> a couple hours ago, I was thrilled. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah see, exactly so. You know, and, uh, and that's how it is. When I finished a book, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that's a surprising answer. I, um, they just, you know, these, these, they really feel like real people to us. Oh, they are real and, people. Um, but say the thing is, they wouldn't be. Be dead, you know, necessarily when I'd finished the book. I mean, I can find them anytime. And of course, we can always pick up Outlander and reread, which yep. we've done many, many times. <laughs> well, all good things must come to an end. Huh? Like this talk. Uh, <laughs> On behalf of the Sacramento <laughs> Public Library and your readers, Diana, I'd like to thank you well, thank for you. being here and talking with us tonight. Uh -huh. We wish you continued success and uh, with Moby and the TV series and any other projects you have in store, we will help make those successful. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>I certainly enjoyed the evening, and thank you so much to all of you for coming, and to Stephanie and her fellow librarians for uh, putting this uh, this lovely event together for us tonight. You're very welcome. I will be more than happy to sign your books if you don't have a signed one already. We did some pre-sign some, so if you don't want to stand in a long line to uh, have it personalized, you don't have to. If you do want it personalized, be happy to do that for you. You know, and also if you need happy birthday or happy 40th anniversary, that's fine. Uh, let's since there are 975 of you, let's try not to say to my biggest fan ever who has bought all of the books. <laughs> Let's try to avoid that kind of thing. But, uh, anyway, I will see you all uh, momentarily. Thank you.